All right, so unit one, a not so new world. This is all taken from America and narrative history. This is the 11th edition we're working on now. All right, guys, so let's kick this off. Let's get started. Um, from the very beginning, collision of cultures. I like the way the book actually describes this. It's not a new world. It's pretty much rediscovered, if that. So keep this in mind. It's not new. These people are not uncivilized. Um, just because you're different doesn't make you uncivilized. I think that's a big mistake we have to learn um, uh, that we have made before. But who was here first? From the very beginning, who got here first? Um, our The most prevalent theory is uh, the Bering Strait theory, um, that ancestors actually crossed over during the last ice age. Uh, roughly about 10,000 years ago, we see uh, the very end of the last ice age. Our best guess is 12 to 15 thousand years ago, people following game crossed from over from the Asia continent, Russia, uh, through Alaska. Um, and you'll see that all the way down to North America. And this is generation after generation. Don't think the same family started off in Asia. And by the time that kid was like 20, they're already down here in Texas. No, this was generation after generation. That's why it's such a big gap as far as thousands of years. This is why people have split up and we see so many different varieties of people in the Americas, which we we'll get to in a second. Now, over here on the on the right, there is a lot of theories that uh, when the Ice Age actually breached all, Ice breached all the way down to the um, Red Arrow we he see here, that it was possible to sail across the Atlantic Ocean um, along the ice. Um, so it was like a coastal sailing all the way. So. There's some debate about that. Um, a very good documentary that I could recommend is uh, Who Really Discovered America I'm from the History Channel 2016. Um, it's great that uh, examines crazy theories and some well-founded theories and some new stuff that's coming out. So I could really recommend that one. All right. The pre-Columbian Native Americans, before we see uh, Columbus gets, gets here, uh, this is just to stress this, this idea that there's a diverse, it's diverse lands. You've got to realize you've got coastal plains, uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico, more coastal plain. You've got the Rocky Mountains. You've got the Great Plains, the Ohio River Valley. If you've got Sierra Nevada Mountains and California coastline, Mediterranean climate um, versus swampy areas like the, the uh, like Florida and south uh, southeast United States, and then you have New England and uh, that area uh, northern United States. Um, it and jagged shores like things are so vastly different in America that it's going to make sense why people adapted differently and over generations they became different people. We believe there's over 10 millions of people in this area before Columbus ever gets here, over 400 different languages, and a lot of misconceptions. So people will have argued that uh, people did once believe that these people were cannibals. Well, that, for the most part, wasn't the case. Supposedly, there were some the Caribbeans, uh, Native Americans off the coast. Um, they may have been. For the most part, these people weren't cannibals. Um, the idea of human sacrifice, that's not right. Misconceptions that they had no gods and no religion, exact words of Christopher Columbus. No, that's that's not the case at all. Um, so keep that in mind, there's a lot of misconceptions and, and just because people are different doesn't make them wrong. It just makes them different and it's okay to be different. Um, some similarities we do see in early cultures that I think is absolutely fascinating. One of my favorites uh, is this concept of the ancient three sisters. Using the land uh, efficiently, it was actually pretty common throughout the North and South uh, Americas, uh, throughout the Americas, sorry, that you would grow uh, your corn stalk. As it grew up, you would grow beans with it because you needed a vine. Beans actually need a vine. So using the, the corn stalk actually as a um, almost like a fence, the vi bean vines could grow up there and then surrounding area, you could have squash. I don't know if you ever grew squash, but even here in Texas, squash, it's pretty easy to grow. It's hard to mess up. Um, and it takes less nutrient uh, from the soil. Uh, corn, beans, and squash, they actually can grow together. This is called the ancient three sister method, which was seen throughout the Americas. It, it blows my mind when you think about it. Um, there are tons of other crops as well. Um, you can see uh, throughout here, uh, chili peppers, avocados, um, and even pumpkins. Um, and, and you actually see that when you get to some Latin American countries. A cooked pumpkin, sweet pumpkin is actually a dish, um, especially uh, in uh, El Salvador area. I've seen that um, as well, it's, and it's pretty good. 
But uh, this was the early cultures of the Americas from early on, essentially. Um, if we actually look at some early uh, civilizations, um, the three big ones people have always talked about, even that we mentioned are Maya, Aztecs, and Incas. Um, and the permanent farming towns where the people actually establish a, a, a village, if you will, is about 2000 BC. Or, um, and so this is roughly 4,000 years ago. We actually see these villages, small towns being built. And they do have some common um, common structures. You can actually, there's uh, forts. Uh, it looks almost like a fort with the uh, outside perimeter. Um, and all these, um, of course, that's for defense against other tribes or other villages that might come into play. And you do have agriculture surrounding that, as you can see from these uh, these images. Um, and when you think about this, this, this is human. This is mankind's history. Um, even on the other side of the world, <coughs> we see villages are arising. Um, the first humans to not uh, be, uh, to not follow in the footsteps of, as nomad hunters. Um, we believe the Neolithic, Re Neolithic Revolution was around 10,000 years ago when the Ice Age ended. Um, so uh, over here, we don't see a, a big difference in time. And it's amazing that two parts of the world with little interaction, if any at all, um, would have such similar histories as far as um, time frames go. Um, if you do look at the, uh, the time frames, as for Native Americans, we do see um, 750 BCE, to roughly 900 CE current error, in case you're wondering what that means. Um, similar to AD, depends on which book you read or who um, you listen to, but um, the minds rule. And at 900, they actually do fall apart uh, before then, um, but the minds have a fascinating um, uh, uh, civilization. It's actually Tikal, I actually recognize that as Tikal uh, in Guatemala. So there's, there's more Central America um, and they're probably most known for their counting system and also their calendars. Their calendars were so exact, 365 days, um, literally. Um, and of course, you guys remember it's 2012, theory that because that's when their calendar ended, the, our world would end. Obviously, just another conspiracy theory. The Toltecs going to rule afterwards. They're going to take that, that to another level, essentially. Um, we see, uh, uh, we do see that better statues, uh, more details. Um, we don't talk about them a lot. Um, and that's mainly because none, neither one of these are around when Europeans actually will come to America. And we talk about Europeans coming to America. Some of the first ones we talk about, you guys know very well, um, is Cortez. Um, he'll actually arrive 1519. Um, and the empire of the time uh, there in Central America, uh, current Mexico, uh, current U.S. Mexico is um, uh, the Aztecs. Um, and, and that's the one that a lot of people are familiar with, and, and they're probably the more interesting ones for students, at least. Um, also, we do have the Incas. They're going to be off the coastline. Um, it is a wide belief that the Aztecs had roughly 5 million people in the empire um, under their control. Uh, again, estimates are hard to figure out when we actually look at the, um, the numbers um, because diseases wipe out many people or many natives before even Spanish can get there. Uh, disease moves faster, moves much faster. Uh, uh, along the uh, Andes Mountains, we'll actually see the Incas. Uh, uh, these people have made extensive roads, uh, 2,500 miles of roads on the side of mountains, literally, without much scenery. Over 12 million people, 12 different languages spoken. Um, and they had a really interesting way to communicate with each other. If you ever get a chance to, to look into this, it's pretty interesting. Um, they had a, a rope, and in this rope, they would tie certain knots and certain lengths of the rope. And one person could take that rope, um, deliver it to the nearby village along the way, right? Um, and the leader would read the rope because it meant something, how far away it was and the knots used. And it could be something simple as meeting here this date, right? Um, and he would acknowledge that, give the rope to somebody, and they would move it to the next town. So they're actually using these roads, not only were able to transport, not a lot, granted, um, these are small roads on mountains, but they were able to uh, communicate with each other and move about. It's absolutely amazing that they were able to do this without the um, machinery um, industry that we would see later on in other parts of the world and in America, that's right. Real quick. Won't go into too much details about the 
over all Native Americans. Um, but when we look at this in the United States alone, because this is U.S. history, we'll eventually narrow this down and get down to U.S. history. And just this area alone, over 10 million inhabitants, we believe, over 240 languages. Some of these you might recognize. Um, if I move my big head out of the way, you actually see we have the, the Apache, Navajo, um, Cheyenne, Sioux, Blackfoot, uh, Choctaw, Seminole. Um, some of these actually sound familiar, and they and they should. Um, you even see names like Mobile, that specific tribe of the Choctaw. They uh, the Mobile, uh, they're uh, cities are named after them. Um, Biloxi as well. Um, there's even uh, uh, st uh, states named after Native American tribes. So some of these are well known, some of them are less so. And to say they all exist at the same time would be um, naive. Um, there are times when some are stronger than others. Um, and we actually see that when we do look at Native Americans specifically in the United States, the history of people often think is um, straightforward, but there it goes back a long time. Uh, and, when we, and, and it's way too easy to um, forget that, um, that the, it's not just patchy and teepee, stuff like that. Um, some of you may have never heard of Pacific Northwest. And while this isn't really important in social structure, um, when you see this, and this is all the way from Alaska, and uh, this will be California down here, this coastline where the, where the Pacific Northwest Native Americans actually dominated, you had different tribes there. Um, you should look at that and know just from that map, their main source of food was definitely not farming, right? If you had to take a guess, it would be fishing. Um, and so that should make sense. That shouldn't surprise you at all. Um, again, people adapt to geographical uh, location. Uh, you have the Hopewell. I need a hope well, people. There's actually too few people, uh, but we see how far we believe uh, these these mound builders uh, actually uh, uh, went um, under control and trading. Um, essentially, we do I don't like to say control, more like the trading sites. Um, and you will actually see there have been uh, circumstances of where they found Aztec or what we believe um, arrowheads uh, made from uh, the same substance the Aztecs used from volcanoes all the way in this area in the trading. So it's pretty interesting. We're not hundred percent sure, but that's what history is trying to figure it out. But these guys did trade with this vast area at one point in time. Um, and this is 700 BC to 200 BC uh, or 200 CE. So, um, uh, so this is before um, we see huge areas of um, the Roman empire during this time. This is to give you a comparison um, as they spread out. Um, you would think that's hard to be, but these were what we call uh, mound builders. These actually aren't discovered until the mid 1900s. My airplane's flying over, it looks as if something is here. And what they've done is they recovered these, um, and tore down trees, and actually uh, exposed them. So you can see these are mounds that were built, these huge mounds um, in the shape of animals. Um, and we'll, we'll see that. And this is actually the, the gold, uh, not gold, the quarter from Iowa. Um, one, one of their state courts to show the mound builders. So it's pretty interesting to see that. Again, nobody knew that until the mid-1900s. It's fascinating how we're still learning um, even that recent. All right, so these are other ones in uh, the United States in the area that is now known as the United States. Um, and when you look at these, it's you, people just don't understand that while the Aztecs were strong as in, in their sense, these guys are strong as well. The Mississippian, obviously Mississippi is going to come from that. Um, they do believe that th their main trading area, the city of, I'm going to say this correctly, Cahokia. Um, I don't speak Mississippian, so I did my best. Uh, the, the, the center actually it roughly is 10 stories tall on 14 acres. It's a huge amount of land. And this was from 900 to 1350 AD. This is when the Aztecs were ruling down uh, in, in modern-day Mexico. Up north, you have this vast trading area where they dominated. Um, 15,000 people on 3,200 acres, largest city in North America at the time. Uh, you can order Aztecs are going to match that, if not beat it, when we go for the south in the middle Americas. Uh, but it does disappear. And around 1,300, as do, they do believe it's environmental reasons. Uh, I, I will say this, it seems like every time they can explain what happens, they always blame it on the environment. So, or the environment plays a role. They do it with the Mayans, even the Totecs. Um, a lot of times like, hmm, probably something to do with the environment. They do do research and do, for instance, they can cut open a tree and they can study the time period of the tree and see where there's a serious drought. And in this case, that was, that was uh, true as well. Um, there's a serious drought that may have 
weekend, if not uh, hurt the uh, the city states. Um, but then again, just realizing from history, like as big as you get, you can only get so big before it gets uh, out of control and you lose control. Uh, we go to desert areas. This place is really interesting. Um, there's actually two different tribes, those who have vanished and ancient ones. Those are the names that were given to these people. We can always call this the four corner, uh, four corners, the four corner deserts. Um, it's perfectly shaped states. Eventually, we become perfectly shaped states. And this is a very dry and arid area. Um, roughly 500 CE, also 580, in case you forgot. Um, and be there migrants from Mexico. Um, there's a lot of history. If you actually learn about the migrants from Mexico in those hot desert areas, um, there's. Uh, I remember in um, when I was taking a course over summer in Mexico, that was pretty, pretty uh, evident that the Aztecs originally were actually from the deserts in northern Mexico, and that's how they became so tough when they moved down south and took over. Um, even these guys were able to survive in this dry desert area, and we believe that they came from. Uh, northern Mexico as well. There's no rigid class structure in these uh, dwellings built into the side of cliffs. Um, and the only warfare they ever had was self-defense, purely self-defense. Again, misconception people have about Native Americans, it differs so much from tribe to tribe. These guys, only self-defense. Others would have slaves, but only ones that they captured from war. That's actually pretty common in most cultures. Um, the United States version of slavery is a very perverse version of it, um, as a matter of fact. Um, I don't have to know these exact names, but uh, just to give you an idea, these are also called Eastern Woodlands. And when you look at the United States, after this, it does get to the Great Plains, the Rocky Mountains. These are a different type of geographical areas. And we kind of narrow down and shove the uh, uh, different Native Americans uh, into categories when uh, Europeans start to arrive. These are the ones. Um, when Europeans arrive, these are what they see. Uh, we call them Eastern Woodlands, the Great Plains, and the Western ones. You don't hear a lot about the Western ones in Great Plains because U.S. history does so little on them because by the time United States colonists actually get over there, they pushed so far, so many Native Americans over that they're conflicting with each other and fighting with each other. Um, it's pretty horrible exactly how that goes down, but nonetheless, it is part of a history we cannot ignore, right? All right, when we look at these, uh, if you look at this and you think Pocahontas and you think of deer skin, uh, that's not too far off from it. Um, that is um, woodlands. Um, uh, these Native Americans, I won't ask you certain specific ones on tests or anything like that, but you do you do need to understand that they adapt to their, to their geographical settings. That's why they're so vastly different. When you look at them versus Eskimos versus Native Americans who live on Great Plains, whose dwellings were teepees, right? In the Great Plains, they would have teepees. Some, Iroquois, actually lived in these huge huts. We had up to uh up to 50 members of a family it wasn't immediate family but large family living in those and these are permanent structures makes sense where they were versus native americans of great plains that chase after their food sources and so their teepees had to be mobile right that's pretty interesting the iroquois will actually form a confederacy of their own um and and they will actually uh take the size when it comes to british and french uh, and they are quite well organized well later on after english come they actually would actually have their own constitution as well they'll get that from the uh the colonies um but uh because colonies and states all have their uh versions and they'll actually use that too um the reason why they say permanent when I mean, compare them to like the great plains is they had corn which meant permanent settlements neolithic revolution teaches you that way back to world history. Once people can grow their own food, they can stay in one area and everything changes, right? If you can grow your own food, you don't have to spend all your time hunting and chasing. If you look at even animal documentaries, you'll see lions would eat like once every few days. Animals barely get by. Most of the time they fail at hunting. And when they are successful, that food has to stay in them for a long time. Humans were the same way. It took all their endurance, all their efforts to get food and they were able to get the food, eat, and then move on and get more food. The Neolithic Revolution, even though that happens across, we, we look at that first case, uh, first cases we have, or that first evidence we have that may be in what's called the Old World um, and the Eastern Hemisphere, if you will. But it does happen here as well. People are going to grow their own corn and they're going to be able to settle down, which means if they grow their own corn, then there's people to settle and govern. People ask questions why, which means religion. People to do other things like build canoes 
right? Uh, build pottery, that's big, and, and not necessarily this area, but other areas. So uh, food uh, grown on your own meant a permanent settlement. That's why it's so vastly different. That's again why we say Native Americans adapt to their uh, geographical environment. That's true. Uh, farther over, you can have you can see some of these other Indians. Some of these names actually probably uh, you probably recognize Georgia, Alabama tribes. Again, you can see where are these states, which happen to be the most conservative, some of the most conservative states in America at the time, are named after Native Americans. Oddly enough, um, and Great Plains uh, from Blackfeet, Cheyenne, Comanche. Apache and Sioux, those are pretty famous, well known because of the Westerns. By the time uh, colonists start moving over um, post Civil War, Civil War era, when they're invading and fighting these Native Americans, there's more documentation on it. So I think that's why they become more popular. And then you have the Western Native Americans far, far. All right, sorry, picking up where we left off. Um, so you, this is diverges from your book. This isn't in your book, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, when we talk about this new land, oftentimes it's always Columbus that gets credit for it. Um, now we know that that's just not true. We just knew everybody. I feel like a common sense person knows Columbus did not discover the new world. Um, uh, maybe in, kin in kindergarten you thought that, but now you know better. We do know our theory is that the Vikings, there were some Viking voyages that actually land here in uh, the new world. Now, how far south they go? Do they actually go to the United States? Mm, there is a question about that. So most people would say no. We're not for sure about that. But we knew, know they do get to Canada and North America. And it all starts right here with Eric the Red. Um, you can actually see that Eric the Red's father was actually exiled from Norway. Um, if you know anything about the Vikings, you'll know that they don't land, conquer, um, start settlements, and stay. They move about. They land, they conquer, they kill, murder, rape, torture, steal, whatever, and move on. Vikings struck fear. That's what they did. Um, even their vessels weren't known as seafaring vessels. Um, oddly enough, though, if you know anything about history, you do know that they, um, when they, when some of them do go to Russia uh, and they go down the rivers too to get to the intercontinent of Russia, they um, they will stop and settle there. And so it kind of explains why the Russians are the way they are, right? Um, but nonetheless. The uh, Vikings, for most part, don't settle anywhere. But we do know that Eric the Red is actually in Iceland um, when he's actually vanished. Uh, not vanished, banished. I apologize. In exile. He's in exile. And from there, he's actually going to go to Greenland. If you wonder what he was exiled for, it was a uh, murder. Killed somebody. His dad did too as well in Norway and was forced to Iceland. And he's going to do the same thing. His banishment, though, is only, I think, for like three years. Um, and he's exiled. Eric the Red comes back from Iceland after discovering Greenland, actually. Um, and so he'll actually come back, discover uh, Greenland, come back to Iceland, pitch that idea, try to tell people about it, about uh, bountiful land. Um, it's wonderful, it's great. Um, there are some areas that's actually pretty good about Greenland, it's not all make-believe. Uh, but he grows up his life doing that, trying to help colonize sites, and barely surviving, really not much of anything, but a, a stopping point. Um, his son, on the other hand, will actually um, be uh, banished as well. Um, he'll be put to exile because he will also murder somebody. Family trait, family trait, they, they kill a lot, Vikings, they do. Um, I actually remember that, that story was actually had, it was arguments about somebody killing somebody's cows and cattle and so they killed him and then you can't do that, you're out, okay. Um, just for a little bit though, only like three years, you can come back. Um, but uh, Eric Durrett's son, Leif Erikson, will actually um, take it further to Greenland and he's gonna spray Christianity. It's actually his job. Um, he feels that's important to actually spread Christianity, um, oddly enough, after murder. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, on the way, he actually has heard rumors about land past Greenland, um, where they talk about how it's warmer and there's more uh, uh, pastures and nice areas. Um, one man actually went that direction, was lost but never saw land, but knew he was close. And you're wondering, how do you know you're close? A variety of things, besides waves busting up, birds are actually a big sign that you're near land. You might not know that, but if you're off the coast um, and you're just looking for land and you see birds, bingo, um, you know you're close to land. And you follow the birds to land, exactly what Columbus would do. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, Leif Erikson, uh, he will actually go further. He'll actually um, rescue a couple of guys when he's blown off course. You can actually see, um, the man he heard from, 
Uh, that Viking, particularly here in the purple, was blown off course, comes back, and that's actually where um, Leif Erikson um, was actually first heard about that as well. Um, Leif Erikson actually go from Greenland after he's exiled. He'll explore the coastline all the way down. And again, this is pretty common when if you're exploring, um, you're not just shooting straight out to land or out to ocean hoping to hit land. That's kind of crazy at the time. Um, it was kind of crazy that like Columbus did it. But this point in time, right on 1000, Leif Erikson is going to follow the coastline and get all the way to North America. And we know for a fact, we've got artifacts, we've got uh, proof that he actually did land there and stayed. We know for at least a year, according to uh, uh, the diaries and accounts by his men, and he'll leave and go back to spread Christianity some more. So Leif Erikson, actually you'll see that, founder of the New World. Um, I still don't like that phrase, it's not New World, he didn't find it. Somebody else found it before him. They're natives here already. Now we debate how they got here, right? Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, he is way ahead of his time, 500 years before Columbus. FYI, Vikings did not wear this stuff in a battle. Um, if Thor didn't do it in Marvel, the Vikings did not do it. Um, they were more ceremonial um, in that. But um, they were some vicious guys. The History Channel didn't make a TV show about them. Uh, I like to show this. Um, timelines because it helps put things in perspective when we talk about what we do know about that land bridge the bearing land straight um from from russia siberia all the way to alaska and what we believe people came down we do think that travel was about twenty three thousand to nine thousand bc e not too sure the reason why we know that is because around ten thousand uh bc when the ice age around ten thousand years ago sorry when the ice age ends um there's no way to cross over. So we know it had to be before the ice age ended. Um, and at 10,000 years ago, uh, uh, at, at 9,000 9, BCE, that's roughly 11,000 years ago. So that has, that's how we know um, it was before then. Uh, you do have C by 100. You have the capital city in Central Mexico is actually uh, populated 150,000 people. You think London's great and other places are big? Think about it. 100, year after, 100 years after Jesus Christ is born in the uh, other side of the world, the city, Central America, Mexico, has a population of 150,000. That's remarkable. 700, the Mayan city of Tikal, had a population of 100,000. And this thing is so big now, like they had no clue how large it really is until recently with new technology. They're able to tell that, hey, this thing's way more buried than we ever thought it was. Tikal, most of it's still buried. They're still trying to figure out how to get to it. And some of it they're actually not even going to touch. Um, it's a pretty interesting place. By 900, 200 years, mine civilization mysteriously disappears. Again, we do blame ecological reasons um, and, and warfare amongst uh, the natives. I, again, I argue that any empire gets too big, can't control itself. Um, and then roughly 100 years later, you see that's when the Vikings, uh, Leif Erikson, would actually discover a new Foundland in uh, North America. Um, those canyon culture sites I showed you earlier are mysteriously abandoned. Um, again, we think it's ecology, strong uh, drought wiped out even them. Um, Aztec Empire is founded in Mexico in 1427. So you see earlier, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What about, uh, I, I thought this was, no, there were Native Americans before Aztecs. Aztecs, and I, and I learned this from going there uh, a few years ago, the Aztecs were invited, but we believe by the local priesthood to get rid of the royal family, to actually murder and chase them out. Um, because it turns out ecological problems were happening in the city, large trading posts, huge, huge, people came from all over trading there. Um, there were problems as far as water. Um, there was less and less water. Part of that was because we believe that they were cutting out so many surrounding trees that the trees weren't soaking up the water and holding onto water. So there's flooding. Um, there's a lot of problems as far as uh, the environment's concerned. And when the royal family of this city actually talked to priests about why are the God, why are the two gods upset? Why is it? And at that time they had two gods. It was a God of water um, and God of air, I believe. I can't remember. They originally would say um, that what it turns out, they're angry because they're one God and they need to merge. Um, and the royal family said, no, we're not building another temple. We have a sun temple. We're not building another one. No, we're not merging them together. Um, think about it some more. And the priests were so upset by this, they contacted, uh, they in contact with what we would call these guys mercenaries now, but these tough, uh, uh, mobile, mean guys in Northern Mexico 
um, called, we believe to be the ancestors of the Aztecs, they bring them down. And when these guys come down, they wipe out the war family, they kill them. Um, we now know, believe that it was uh, from the burn marks we have at the city that it was done inside. It wasn't, it was an outside attack, but we believe that it was a strife from within. And we believe that the uh, priest did that. But it turns out the Aztecs loved it so much, they stuck around. Like the priest wanted them to come in, wipe out the Fuhrer family, start over, um, was ones that would listen to the priest, but the Aztecs stuck around because it was nice, man. It was a nice valley. Um, there was water there compared to Northern Mexico. Like it's pretty crazy. So we believe that's actually the uh, founding of the Aztec Empire, how it actually started. When we talk about Aztecs being mean and tough, you can see why it goes way back. Uh, that's 1427. Uh, uh, Cortez, we come in 1519 and take that out pretty much. Um, the Inca Empire is founded in Peru, 1438. Um, we say that though, that, that, that's such a loose term because um, shortly after Clum, uh, Cortez wipes out the Aztecs, um, we're going to see the Incas get wiped out as well. I mean, they've been building up to, to say that they're just now founded in 1438. It's kind of naive, kind of easy, it simplifies history, right? And then by then, 1492, Columbus makes landfall in the Bahamas, and we're pretty sure it's uh, modern day modern day Haiti. Actually, uh, we're not one hundred percent sure, but that's what most people agree on. So you look at this, and you can actually see that uh, you can talk about other theories too. There was a uh, New York Times bestseller right there, fourteen twenty one, the year China discovered America, and this guy was uh, uh, infamous. He had, had all these primary sources that showed that China had actually been to the New World, and at the time, we actually look at the ship on top here, the big one. That big one is actually the, the common Chinese ship at the time. That little one was one of Columbus's ship. To put in comparison, which one do you think would make it across the ocean? <clears throat> Obviously, the Chinese had the skill. Um, it was said that the Chinese came, collected a few things, um, traveled all over the world, came back. And um, when they came back, there was another emperor in charge. And the other emperor said, we don't need anything else. Um, and these boats actually set in the docks of the Chinese Bay because um, Chinese China became very isolated and didn't care about the rest of the world. Um, and in the words of a Chinese teacher I once knew, uh, she taught Chinese, she goes, China, Chinese didn't need anybody else. So they became isolated. And those boats just sank in the harbors. Uh, what we now, if you talk to any academic historian, I've talked to a couple of my profs. I was asking about this particular book a while back. And they actually said, if you read some academic book reviews about this book, um, other historians laugh at this guy. Um, this guy takes primary sources written in ancient Chinese, but doesn't know ancient Chinese. So he's taking translations of people's translations. And it gets very difficult, especially with, that, with uh, China, Chinese literature and Chinese translations. Besides going from ancient language to a modern language, that's pretty tough if you just do Spanish in Mexico. Like their old school way of saying stuff on their old school birth certificates. And now it's, it's crazy. Imagine doing 2000 year old ancient Chinese to now and tell me they're not going to be biased and stretch things. It's, uh, and you're not even translating somebody else's. So that's actually, uh, kind of laughed at among academics, but it did was a bestseller. So it just shows you what kind of crap sells on the, on the shows. Um, I also have the Polynesians up here and that comes and that link down there actually it's uh probably doesn't work anymore um but it's from the uh, doc uh, uh series uh who rediscovered america by the history channel um made in 2016 and it's fascinating the evidence they have that polynesians almost positive that they did come to americas that's to a point where on the coastline these people are polynesian descent these native americans are polynesian descent um, and, and there's even some that widely accept it. Um, DNA evidence is flimsy, and it's more and more as DNA gets better. We're doing more and more. And this was 2016, so and you fast forward a few years, genetics are taking off. People are figuring out so much more stuff. But there's actually fish hooks that, that date back to pre-Columbus time um, that match uh, the coastline. To, to, uh, Polynesian fish hooks will match. Um, Fish hooks found on coastline by these natives, as well as a type of canoes and uh, boats as well. Um, over here, we, we were, were fairly certain that they did come this far um, because um, facial features are very similar. Um, and some people argue that there's some people off the coast here that actually are Asian. 
um, not just Polynesian, but Asian as far. Um, all of this is new stuff, but it shows you how things are changing over time. Easter Island, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. That's the famous statue with the, uh, that's famous island with the statues. Um, you only see the heads, but they actually have a whole body buried. Um, they, uh, that, that civilization seriously disappeared probably because it's ecological, but it shows you how close it is to South America. It's not unheard of that you can just hop, skip, and away. These boats weren't made to go across large uh, pieces of ocean. And when I say large, I mean like Hawaii to U.S. or Asia to the modern day U.S. But these were made to go from island to island and they could do so. If you're thinking Mulan, uh, not Mulan, I'm sorry, uh, Moana, that's the Polynesian. Uh, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, that's very stereotypical because these guys are mass, uh, vastly different, especially when you look at them. But these are usually the island's people. So it's pretty interesting when you look at who was here. Now, having said that, keep in mind why Columbus was even able to make this journey, not just physically, but what allowed it to happen. And the Renaissance played a huge role in that. And the Renaissance, the Europe emerges from dark ages. I'm not trying to go too far into this because it's more of a world history, but once um, Europe emerged from dark ages, it's not about survival and peasants and knighthood and just surviving in general. It's about thriving. And those wealthy guys in Italy are actually going to be able to pay painters. But not only that, they're going to pay, pay people to invent things. Um, not just Leonardo da Vinci, but other guys. Um, you have here in the bottom left corner is Astrolabe. Um, putting this with the horizon and looking at a star, you actually figure out where you're at on uh, Earth. And if you're thinking, oh, people thought that Earth was flat. No. Arabic had figured this out during dark ages. Arabic said, and in the Middle East in general, had really preserved a lot of the history that would have been lost. Um, that there was some loss, definitely, but a lot of it they preserved a lot of it. And it was actually a story of a guy who looked down a well one day at noon, saw the bottom of the well. He later on walked by that same well that afternoon. It was about say four o'clock, and he couldn't see the bottom. The sunlight didn't reach the bottom. That alone should tell you that the earth is not flat and the sun is not flat shining down, or you would always be able to see down that well, um, that hole in the ground. But if it's curved and the earth and the sun is going over it, then it would make sense why you can't see all the way down it. Um, did the calculations and people were pretty close in guessing the size of the earth, the circumference of the earth. Nobody really thought the earth was flat uh, back then. Only uneducated people. Um, that would be the equivalent to, I don't know, people not wearing masks now. That's what we're talking about. Uh, and this is a COVID area, COVID era. So keep that in mind. Uh, telescopes will emerge from this time. It's going to be huge for traveling, just like the astrolabe. Uh, top right, you have what's one of the early printing presses. And you're thinking, why is that so important? Columbus actually read about these journals, uh, read these journals about these guys who traveled all over. And that's where he got these ideas and learned more and more. And then when, tra when Columbus himself goes over, his, his diary is printed, his words or maps uh, are reprinted, and it's spread all over and starts this. The printing press was huge. It wasn't just knowledge um, from uh, books and old books. It was other things as well, such as um, accounts of the new, quote, new world. The far right, you have an invention right there. I'm going to give you a second to guess where it came from. Originally founded, uh, discovered, and created, sorry, in China. Um, and eventually Europeans will steal it and master it. That is the compass. Um, eventually a huge compass would sit on a, on a uh, ship and you could actually navig help navigate where you are. Between that during the day and the stars at night, you could navigate the astrolabe and the compass. And that's going to change everything. That's why this is even possible for Columbus. So uh, without the Renaissance, this, the world's biggest douchebag, would not have been able to exist. Now, I'm not going to go into too much stories about Columbus. I actually have a 10-minute side clip I made separately. Uh, my students watch it for uh, extra credit um, for the test. But um, in that video, it's a cartoon illustration and very poorly done recording on my part. Um, I try to convince you that Columbus is the biggest douchebag in history because he is, even though we celebrate his own day. Um, Long story short, the video kind of, I'll summarize the video. He does um, go, go around asking for funds to explore. He goes to Portugal. He's gone to the French, he's gone to the British. Um, he himself is actually Italian, um, Christopher Columbus. He's not Spanish, people think he is. Uh, he gets funding from the Spanish crown who just beat out the last of the Moors or the Muslims out of Europe. And they're doing fairly well. And, and, and when they give him the money for this route, it's a joke really. It's literally like me betting a hundred bucks. Is 
is not chump change, but it's not a lot either. Um, that's how much money in comparison. That's why they only give him three ships and send him on his way. Uh, remember Cortez arrived in Mex Mexico with 10 or 11 ships. Like keep that in mind. Like it's, it's amazing how little they actually gave him. He actually would leave there early August. Uh, and then he would stop at the Canary Islands for repairs. And I didn't know this, but recently I read how he actually believed at one point that, um, the sailors were sabotaging the ship. Because they had to stop and repair a ship and it took 30 days to repair it and most many of the sellers wanted to just leave it behind they thought it was a bad omen he thinks some of these guys had second thoughts and they actually were trying to um sabotage the ship um takes about a month and then he's back off on the road again nah, he's heading out he's heading um uh west towards what he thinks is going to be um the uh, Indonesia, we call the Indies. They call them the Indies back then, but it's Indonesia Islands, um, right near uh, Asia. That's where he's trying to head to to get his spices. Everybody knows that at this point in time, the Europeans, to get spices from the Far East, to get ink products from the Far East, uh, they had to trade with the people in between Europe and the people in Asia. Um, and those people in the middle were uh, uh, Arabics or the Middle, middle Eastern people. And so you had to trade with them they marked up the price quite a bit and they made sure they made their money. Um, and so there's this idea of how can we get it quicker? And Columbus says, ah, it's not that far, man. Let me just go around real quick and get there. Um, he was grossly wrong. Everybody else had different ideas of how big the world was. For some reason, this guy just was for sure. Um, Spain throws a little money his way. says, all right, go at it. Um, and after a month at sea or months at Canary Islands, um, leaves early September. By August, his man, or by October, sorry, about a month later, we have August. September, and then uh, after about a month, his men say, hey, we want to turn back. They start a mutiny. Columbus begs him for a little bit more time. He, uh, he says, give me two more days, and then we'll turn around and go back. And in two days, this guy spots land, um, and, uh, or two days later, actually, technically, first Columbus sees birds, and they start following the birds, and then um, this guy spots land. And Columbus looks out, follows the birds, and he's actually going to discover. We think he uh, uh, actually lands in, uh, there's massive debate, um, Haiti first. Um, but um, even the Bahamas, you see that uh, he is, is a route from the Bahamas, cuts through them. There's one account in his diary where he talks about at nighttime, a giant flame came up from the ocean, and went to the sky. And if you watch Ancient Aliens, they tell you it was an alien ship coming up from the ocean. And it's in Columbus's diary. Most people with common sense uh, look for the uh, actual reason. And in this case, they uh, discover that he actually uh, probably saw Native Americans at one of these nearby Bahama Islands, and they had a giant bonfire going up. Um, but if you follow ancient aliens, that's what happened. But now this, this is Columbus. He's going to come, murder, kill, rape, torture, steal. Um, it's oddly enough, the first people he sees are so nice to him, they offer him tobacco smoke. And for the first time, he smokes tobacco. And it blows my mind because I got to ask a question. If you came to these new people that you've never seen before and they gave you this stick and this, their pipes were a little different. They didn't smoke from the mouth. They had these two Y pipes that went into your nose and you inhaled the smoke like that. I don't know about you, but if you give me this pipe or this tr twig is this stick and you got holes in it and you shove this two Y piece up my nose and you tell me to breathe in as I light the other end on fire, I might think twice, but Columbus was all about that. And tobacco is uh, is uh, shown to Columbus and he falls in love with it, like most Europeans do. Tobacco did exist, but uh, the Middle Eastern uh, middle traders had, had it under wraps. Like you couldn't even, if you got found taking a tobacco plant from Middle East to Europe, you punished my death. Like that's how much they were trying to make sure you couldn't, they didn't want Europeans growing tobacco. They couldn't, turns out the climate wasn't that good. Um, we'll talk about which climate is good in another future chapter. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what Columbus is uh, actually going to do. Um, he's going to uh, do that, man, take some slaves back. Um, even the Spanish crown will tell him, um, be nice to these. Uh, when he heads back, he brings six slaves with him, um, Native American slaves. Um, and, and even the Spanish crown is, is disgusted by this. They be nice. These are new subjects. These are our new subjects. They are our people just like you are. Make sure you're nice to them. Columbus wasn't. But again, watch the video. I'll try to post a link here if I can. Um, if not, it'll be in the comment section. Um, and it goes into more detail about just how horrible Columbus is 
in general. But the main thing about Columbus isn't that he discovered it first. We proved that wrong. Everybody knows that. Columbus starts it. Once Columbus does this, once he discovers this, now everybody wants to come over. That's the thing about Columbus. He wasn't a genius. This was an accident. This is a goof up. Uh, but once he figures this out and other people see it, they want to uh, copy that. They, other people want to do that. And they're going to do that in huge numbers. Columbus should think of him as opening the floodgate. He's, he didn't, he wasn't the first one over here, but he was the first one who started uh, the trend for everybody to come over and look for more and more. Spain at the time is able to do it. Uh, we'll get into religious reasons, actually, why Spain and Portugal were able to do this versus other countries who weren't um, able to yet. Um, but that's Columbus. Um, again, watch the video. You'll see why he's the world's biggest douchebag in general. I want to stop and show you this real quick. The two countries that were coming over here in huge numbers, um, first were Spain and Portugal. You see, the blue here is actually where Portugal had control. People don't realize Portugal, that tiny little country next to Spain, was dominant in the area along Africa and around the Africa itself and even into India. Look at their land. Like they were going coast to coast, establishing these colonies and establishing control. Spain, that's actually one reason why people wanted to go from Europe around the world to the Indonesia area to find, to get a short way to get uh, the, um, the salt, uh, the minerals, and other precious things like spices. Um, it was because they didn't want to deal with the Middle Eastern people taking that, that mid cut, and it's very difficult to travel. The canal didn't exist yet. Um, or you have to deal with Portugal. Every time you land in a Portugal uh, uh, area, you'd have to pay Portugal. You have to pay them. And Portugal would say, no, you can't land here. You're Spanish. Um, or they could have like what we would call a tariff now. Um, so it made sense to try to find a shorter route. It was stupid to think that it was uh, uh, that short as they thought it was. But that's how Christopher Columbus is going to start discovering areas for Spain. Portugal would jump in on this too. Remember the printing press? Everybody knew about this. So Portugal is going to start exploring this new world. And just like you thought, problems are going to rise. Tensions building. Portugal and Spain are starting to lay claim at who has what. And in steps, the leader of Europe at the time, as you can probably guess, is the Pope himself. Um, he will make a dividing line that says, okay, on this half of the world, uh, Spain will explore, have, keep other side would belong to Portugal. And that's why Portugal will actually have the country of Brazil. And that's why Brazil speaks Portuguese and not Spanish like everybody else, in case you were wondering. Um, also, it makes Portugal, guess what? Their number one export, and I hate to say it like that because it sounds inhumane, but they're going to um, be big on slave trade. That's why Spanish didn't, wasn't big on slave trade. They were big on receiving slaves. Um, but as far as making money off slave trade, Portugal takes over for that. And they're doing huge numbers. Um, and actually, one of the last countries to actually end the slave, to end uh, slavery was Brazil. Um, the United States is the second to last country on this half of the world to end slavery. Brazil was the last. Um, just amazing how that affects it. But that was the treaty that uh, the Pope himself actually established. Um, because back then, most of Europe followed uh, the Pope because most of Europe was Catholic, remember? Um, the Crusades and all that good stuff that played a role. But that does change. Now, what the Europeans see when they first came to this area, I think is fascinating. Imagine if you're European and never seen an iguana or flying squirrels or a fish with whiskers like cats. Now we know as, duh, catfish. Rattlesnakes, bison, anacondas. You never saw an anaconda before. You landed in the Amazon and now you have that. So that's scary. Vampire bats, kind of creepy. Turkeys, that's funny. And guinea pigs, people from Peru, talking about you. Even llamas. Um, all that's what Europeans saw they never saw before. Um, and that's a little bit different than what natives saw when these Europeans came over. Horses. Now, horses did exist in the in what we in that side of the world, but their ancestors had died out a long time ago. I, I want to say it goes back to like woolly mammoth times. Um, these giant horse-like animals uh, existed but died off um, way before. So uh, it is going to be the Spanish specifically that bring most of these over, the Europeans, uh, mainly Spanish. Horses, cattle, um, no, none of that existed here in the New World. Pigs, which would overrun the Caribbean within 50 years of introduction. And even where I'm from, Central Texas, um, people go hog hunting. 
because they're so over there's no like natural predator for pigs and hogs on the side of the world so they just overrun it like a bunch of rodents and spread all over and even today they're considered a pest um you can hunt them year round there's no hunting season you don't have to have special papers or anything like that you can hunt pigs year round some people do it all over texas uh here on the coast where we're at now most people fish right but you go to central texas you see a lot more uh, hog hunting sheep goats that's all new natives never saw these before uh, europeans are going to bring it with them you can imagine uh that it's called the columbian exchange because that was this idea like all this is exchange here's some really interesting ones uh, and i think some of these are worth noting we'll go through them um the americas will actually have these products on the left uh and it'll be taken to europe for the first time um beans obviously is one but chocolate guys chocolate when you think of chocolate you think of milk chocolate dutch chocolate people often think of european chocolate did not exist yet not until uh the colombian exchange i have up here the great biological experiment we'll talk about that in a second but uh usually when it comes to the, the food it's called the colombian exchange um as actually our europeans that will mix it with milk for the first time and make it a little bit less strong a milk chocolate is like 30 percent chocolate a lot more milk and sugar and other stuff um versus 70 percent the dark chocolate stuff the original um and even like 90 percent you can't stand uh corn is big uh obviously corn is saves the lives of uh people uh, but corn is also can grow in a lot of areas it's actually pretty well known europeans actually don't digest it well and it makes sense and i've had this debate before with people uh, uh spanish descent or um more importantly of native american descent they is i believe that they can digest corn better i mean we're told that we can't that corn uh has no nutrient substance that it passes right through you um but these people in this side of the world for thousands of years this was their food product corn tortillas maize this is what they ate i would argue that their bodies can do this and when you have these new uh nutritionists that say corn's bad for you and whatnot i don't think they take consideration everybody they're talking about specific groups of people like probably people with me that's like 99 percent european corn's probably not that great for me right but somebody else i do think it is acceptable so that's uh that's really interesting when you look at evolution how people have diets were so different for thousands of years why are they result so differently uh peanuts pineapples potatoes are huge potatoes and sweet potatoes that changes the whole world potatoes can grow almost anywhere i challenge you go bury some potatoes grow potatoes it's easy as a matter of fact it's so easy a uh, little place called ireland uh, if you ever heard of them will start growing potatoes and they're so cheap so affordable and they grow so easily that the population in ireland actually explodes more and more people live in ireland and then hundreds of years later there's a potato famine the crop dies out but the population is so big that people literally will start starving because the potatoes are gone um, they had grown so much from potatoes that with now without potatoes people are starving and they were flooded in huge numbers and this is about the time of civil war people will come over to america uh, there's entire irish uh, calvaries um, and militias in a civil war um, that's how many irish are coming over in huge numbers we'll talk about that later pumpkin squash tobacco does go over to europe in huge numbers tobacco will be a huge huge uh, it's very addicting so it makes a good crop right um, tomatoes and turkeys as well versus on the other side you probably never thought about this but on north america the americas uh native americans didn't have this some of the stuff on the right was brought over from europe and was planted in americas and took off well that people don't even realize bananas that's not south america that's not in hawaii that wasn't there originally it's brought over uh that's mediterranean climate in southern europe where a lot of stuff comes from uh cattle chickens we know that um citrus fruits uh coffee beans are actually brought over and grown and now you go to certain areas like costa rica and central america coffee is a big a really big deal really big crop there uh grapes horses we talked about onions nobody really cares about onions so whatever uh, peaches that's interesting you think of georgia peaches and peaches in the united states not even native to the united states at all uh pigs we talked about rice rice is actually brought over um and now you'll have like areas like in georgia and stuff like they have predictable floods with the rivers and they can actually have rice in that area big one here sugarcane people often don't realize how important sugarcane is to the islands the huge increase in slaves brought over was for sugarcane um sugarcane is one of the hardest most difficult jobs ever and we talk about numbers of uh, slaves dying from disease 
and from overwork. It's the sugarcane plantations in the Caribbean, far, far worse than those cotton fields in South uh, United States. Not to justify that, not to justify either one, but to be, be realistic, realistic uh, it's pretty tough um, in the Caribbean because sugarcane, and it brings a lot of slaves over. When you look at the numbers, it's huge in amounts. Um, wheat is actually brought from Europe over to North America, transplanted there, and eventually it'll grow there. When we actually look at uh, evolution itself, um, the Chinese people for thousands and thousands of years, their main crop was rice. If you know anything about rice, you can grow a lot of it, but doesn't have a lot of protein, right? So without that protein, you don't grow big and strong, but you have enough to feed a lot of people. Right. So Asians, typically population was always more than the population in Europe. But the people themselves in Asia are smaller in stature. Europeans are taller, bigger, way more. Europeans is not the wheat that they ate. It was a like cattle that ate the wheat. It was a cattle, um, the cows in Europe with all that extra land and the cows. That was the main source, uh, a huge source of food for thousands of years cattle and wild animals in Europe. And so while there's, it's very difficult to hunt and eat uh, and capture and kill and eat animals in Europe, especially with cat cattle itself too as well, wild cattle before they tamed them, there wasn't a lot of it, so there wasn't a huge population. But those that did survive had that protein and growth. And so over thousands of years, when you look at Europeans and then you look at Asians, you can look now and see the difference and their diets for thousands of years actually create a different types of population. It's amazing. And then you have the, uh, those in America have a tiny different digestive system that evolved over time. So when people say evolution is not happening still, like, where's it at? You're just, you don't understand it. Uh, this is kind of recap. I just do add a couple other things here. Disease. The Europeans will be probably the most common one is smallpox that will wipe out over 90% of Native Americans. I don't want to compare it to the coronavirus or COVID because not nearly that bad. But you can just imagine people with no immunity to this disease. It spreads crazy and does horrible, horrible things. Smallpox is the main one. These other ones are there too. Types of flus, right? Um, measles and other things, even malaria. That's brought over here and spreads pretty bad. But smallpox was a big one itself. Um, and it's going to wipe out over 90% of Native Americans. Um, it spreads faster than the Europeans can get to the Americas. Um, so it is, it's, it's pretty bad. But one thing that one, uh, I heard one, somebody suggest one time is the, uh, uh, the problems people get from tobacco and numbers of people who die from tobacco and cancer, um, far outweigh the numbers over time, the smallpox. So there is a light that if you wanted to see it from a Native American's point of view, you may have wiped out a lot of Native Americans, smallpox Europe, but Europe, you got tobacco and a lot of people died over the course of the past couple thousand years from tobacco. So in the end, the Americans may have won. There's also one point. There is another um, disease that Europeans actually get from Native Americans that nobody really talks about, um, but it's an STD, um, syphilis, if you will. Um, but that was actually not European. That was actually um, an American uh, STD that spread back over. So. Europe got that too. So, but nonetheless, why is this biological experiment so important? First of all, in the middle here, I have the two biggest ones: corn and potatoes can grow everywhere. By the end of the 1500s, keep in mind, Columbus 1492, uh, Cortez 1519. By the end of the 1500s, less than a century later, sweet potato and corn are staple uh, crops in. China, meaning that they're supporting, they're wide over, they're widespread, people are eating them, it's actually supporting them. Within 100 years, you're feeding other parts of the world with this new crop that can grow almost anywhere in any climate very easily. Uh, what we realize is that the crops in Americas are complementary to each other instead of competitive. I don't know if you understand this, but there's a lot of times crops compete with each other and take nutrients from the soil. Um, they're fighting for the same nutrients. Crops in Americas actually were uh, could could grow together. Like I gave the example of the ancient uh, three sister method of corn, beans, and squash. They didn't steal nutrients from each other. Um, they actually were able to grow with each other and use different nutrients from soil. That's very different from European crops. Um, actually, if you look at the numbers now, North America food, uh, crops that grow in North America that were, that were discovered there and brought to the rest of the world. If you fast forward to modern times right now, over one third of all the food in the world 
actually comes from North America. That's how important this, uh, this experiment was with Columbus. I've already talked about this already. It's just some numbers that actually give you uh, uh, as far as the deaths go. I don't like to talk about statistics much because one, I don't ask specific numbers on tests. Um, that's kind of uh, trivial. Um, it's a theme so you under need to understand. Um, and also, I'll mention some numbers and go back and realize, hey, these sources don't match up. We're seeing millions difference, and you'll see that. Uh, but hey, but let's look at the Spanish Empire right now. 1547. Um, this is shortly after Columbus uh, sailed the ocean blue in 1492, right? Um, this is actually what Spain has in Europe. A lot of people don't realize that Spain had that much power over Europe. After Spain kicks out the Muslim and Moors, they're doing very wealthy. That's why they threw the money at Columbus. They're like, yeah, sure, we're doing fine. Um, uh, once, uh, uh, hundred years before this, the Roman Empire had fell. Um, France at this point has fallen. Um, it's pretty weak. So Spain actually was growing pretty strong by 1547. Uh, part of that was a gold and coming in from Cortes and Central America, like they were, they were doing fairly well. Um, Spanish Empire often overlooked as one of the greatest empires, the largest empires. Um, so the blue is Portuguese, right? I'm talking about them. Every other color at one point in time belongs to Spain. Um, they're marked in colors by when they're lost. Uh, the pink ones are obviously lost um, early on in Europe, right? Where they're going to be lost. Uh, we see this French Napoleon thing play out too. Um, the red are lost after the French, after Napoleon's beat, um, after Spain regains their independence from uh, the French. Um, Spain eventually would give all this up. <coughs> and if you actually look at it, sometimes they lose stuff and take it back. Florida went back and forth from Spain to British, back to Spain, and eventually to America, uh, United States hands. But some of these aren't like perfect, but all, uh, and then you have like Spanish American war over here with the, with the, uh, the Philippines and Cuba over here. So uh, at one point, Spain had so much. This empire was vast. Um, and this often forgot about just how large of an empire that they were. Uh, we always talk about other empires, um, how great and how much land. Spain is often not realized. Um, and this is a, a main focus for us as U.S. history is um, this area. And to put it bluntly, this is what's written in one soldier's diary. We came here to serve God and the king and also get rich. Um, so you have heard the f phrase before, God, glory, and gold. That's where it comes from. Um, and that's what the Spanish conquistadors did. These guys who conquered, this was their goal. Um, remember, Columbus gets 10% of his commission from gold. 10% uh, of all the gold he gets. Cortez, I think, got up to 20%. And then all his men split 20% and the rest would go to the crown. So gives you an idea why they wanted so much uh, gold and more and more is never enough. Cortez himself is uh, actually, it's a pretty interesting case. He's actually going to land here in, uh, he's going to leave Cuba with his man. Um, he's supposed to go under the Cuban governor's rule. It's pretty interesting. The Cuban governor uh, gives him permission to go, gives him 11 ships, 600 soldiers. Um, he adds 200 Cubans uh, at the end of it. They're going to actually go with him. Um, he's going to land at what's now called Veracruz and around central Mexico. He has 16 horses and some cannons with him. That's it. He's just supposed to explore. The Cuban governor knew Cortez. Cortez had a reputation. He tells Cortez, you can explore, but you must be within a day's hike of your ship off the coast. Meaning you can't go everywhere and explore everywhere. You have to stay within a day's hike of your ship. The Cuba governor feared Cortez's ambitions. He knew he wanted to go farther. He knew he, this guy had, was very determined, had a huge drive, and he was worried about that. Uh, Cortez uh, lands in Veracruz, um, makes some, it's kind of like this loophole where he declares himself as, rule, as his own ruler and can decide whatever he wants to do, and pretty much blows off the Cuba governor and says, screw that guy, whatever. Um, he doesn't know. And now I'm going to go find this gold because he's talked. He's heard stuff. He's talked to the Americans. He's going to go find gold. He didn't know what he's going to come across yet. And doing so, as there's 11 ships, Cortez was set uh, fire to 10, leaving one ship. And he does this. And he tells the man, one ship, that ship is going to be filled with gold and go back to Spain. So that tells you there's no retreat. We're on all the way. Nothing is stopping us.
and he begins his march. And this is a huge long march um, all the way through. Down here at the bottom, we have some stops along the way. And the story is very greatly. Uh, Columbus will actually meet a um, woman who will actually translate for him. Um, uh, La Malincha. I'm pronouncing that horribly wrong. I do apologize. Uh, but nonetheless, she actually becomes his first wife. And it's believed that the first Spanish Native American uh, child or between Cortez and her. Um, it's just one of many wives Cortez takes, to be honest. Um, I often heard her name used slang as traitor by some people. It's interesting uh, concept. It depends on who you ask. Um, but then again, we look back and people hate Columbus. Generally, people hate Columbus. Um, he'll have his, in December 2020, he's getting his head cut off. His statue's all over, we're getting head decapitated. Um, it's, in Mexico, Columbus, the statue gets uh, vandalized all the time. My last time I went there was like five years ago and it was vandalized repeatedly with paint. Um, but when you ask people about Cortez, there seems to be this, uh, it is what it is type deal. Um, but um, he was doing the same thing as Columbus um, and search for gold. But it seems at this point, because he's Spanish, the Spanish will eventually mix with Native Americans um, and create uh, in, in Mexico, right? Um, but Columbus, I guess maybe because he was Italian, he was just seen as a colonizer. Cortez is seen as one of the own people. It does make a difference. I think Clum Cortez will stay in Mexico afterwards. And then we'll talk about that. But on his march from Veracruz, he's going to march along. He's going to meet uh, other tribes and he's going to learn about the Aztecs and all the gold. And of course, he sees some of the gold on the way. They, these these uh, smaller tribes and villages will have gold. Many of them are just under control. And you've heard the stories of how they hate Aztecs, which was true. Um, and so they would likely uh, ally with Cortez, especially when they see this guy marching through with all this firepower. Some of these villages, he would just show up. And if you heard that they were a threat, he would announce ahead of time that he wants to meet in the town square. And the leaders and all the men would meet in town square waiting to talk to Cortez. And it was really just an ambush. And he just wiped and killed them all out. If he thought they were slightly a threat, that's actually what he did. Some of them, if he thought he could conquer them or convince them to help him, he had them march with them. Eventually, there's like 30,000 um, of these people that were ready to follow Cortez. Now, you've heard the legend that apparently Cortez was mistaken for a god because of his pale skin, white hair he had. Um, but that, actually, when I went to Cornabaca in Mexico, um, I learned there that that account, that story that they mistaken him for a god, was only told by Cortez, and it was told four years later. There's nobody else's account that these guys thought Cortez was God. Now, Montezuma, the emperor of the Aztec Empire, will send go to Cortez before he even gets there. And people say, oh, that just shows that he was scared of him. He was trying to give him gold to run away. No, if, if you talk to people and historians there, they have a different viewpoint. They say, no, what you do as emperor, you have that gold, you send the gold to him and you show him, hey, look, Look how much I have. This means nothing to me. You want to just take it? Go. Get out of here. That's how much I have. That's how powerful I am. This means nothing to me. That's a different mindset um, compared to what Cortez says, that they were scared of me because they thought I was God and they tried to appease me with all this gold. Um, two different stories, um, just like history always does to us. But nonetheless, he is going to march all the way up to the Aztec Emperor Empire. And it's the, the, story, the whole story is fascinating how he actually conquers them. Um, and it, it gets to be pretty amazing when we talk about that.